Well, good evening. My name is John Freeman. I am the chairman of the program and events committee of the San Francisco Historical Society. And um, I'll give you just the overview of the first three months. We want to establish this site as uh, a good historic base. So tonight we've got David McCarthy, who is going to wow you, believe me, he's going to wow you on the history of this building, the history of, of all that went on with uh, coins and bullying on and all that kind of stuff. We talked before, and I was just mesmerized with what he had to say and looking forward to hearing it in depth. So that's first. Next one, we have uh, <clears throat> uh, Richard Everett, who, if you look at this centerpiece over here and the, uh, the sunken ships, within a block of this, Montgomery Street was the, the beginning of the of terra firma, the rest of it was all water. So there was a whole bunch of, of sunken ships that were in that bay out there. And so he's going to take us from here out to the sunken ship. So that's next month's program is going to be about the recovery, uh, the excavation, and all you learn when you bring up the sunken ship. That came by way of the fact that new buildings were built in this a lot of this is all filled in, obviously, because this is not the waterfront anymore. Um, and then the third month, March, we have two authors who are going to talk about Chinatown and its relationship to uh, primarily women. And we're talking about the uh, uh, Don a camera and the camera house and what that did. And so we're going to look a little bit further into this neighborhood and, and, and line up, find out a lot more about the whole process <laughs> of exploiting women and saving women, Chinese women, uh, during the uh, well, very long history from the Egypt you saw it. But, uh, so that's our third month. Next three months, we'll talk about that after the committee has met and we have a better idea of how we want to keep this going. So I'm trying to shoot for this year, having a lot to do with, this is the hub of a lot of history. And once we've done that, then I'm going to open it up next year to wherever we want to go with any kind of topic. Um, we may not pull, pull this off, we have 10 months per year, so the first Month, first uh, quarter is three months, the second quarter is three months, and then it's two and two to fill out the year. We never do August, and we never do December. So that's where we're going, and tonight is not indicative of how many people we can pull into this room because everybody's saying the same thing. I don't know if I want to get out of that crowd and that kind of thing. So we're the um, pioneers who are going to take the risks to come here tonight. But there's a whole group of people who are watching us online as well. So, with that, let me just say a couple of words about David McCarthy and the fact that he is the expert on a lot of things, not only numismatic, but also the background of all this stuff. As he and I were talking beforehand, yes, he's, he, that's his topic, numismatism. But, he said, I start with the, 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 the species, the coin, and then I go back and go into the depth of the history. So you get a whole bunch of history from that coin. A whole bunch of that history comes from this building. So I'm going to learn a lot more about this building, and you're going to learn a lot more about this building, because we're approaching it by what the function of this building initially was for. With that, I'm going to start there. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm David McCarthy. I'm going to position myself here because I'm going to be uh, looking at these things as they come up and they're my prompts. But um, I'm really, really incredibly honored to be here. Um, I, I love the San Francisco Historical Society and, you know, it's just, uh, 
an organization I'm hoping to do a lot more work with. Um, a few years ago, I heard that they were going to be moving into this building, and I'm very familiar with the things that have happened here, and so when they asked me to come and uh, do a presentation, I couldn't think of anything better than um, an overview of specifically what happened in this building that changed the course of history for all of the United States. Um, you know, when we're in school, we're all taught Gold Rush, California, and, you know, my recollection of, of, of learning about the Gold Rush and how it impacted California was, well, yeah, this guy found some gold. Many, many people came to California. California became a really important state, then the Civil War, <laughs> you know? And, you know, the truth is that um, the gold rush and subsequently the Comstock load are probably the great transformative experiences for the United States in the 19th century from a perspective of taking the United States from being a uh, former British colony with a lot of resources to being, you know, a real dominant world power. Uh, the money that basically funded the Industrial Revolution in the United States on the East Coast was coming out of the ground here. And whether or not you know it, a tremendous amount of that money passed right below where we're sitting and standing today. Uh, that vault down there basically housed a tremendous amount of the output of the mines in California's gold region and also the Comstock load. Uh, most of the gold and most of the silver that was coming through San Francisco came through here uh, between 18 probably about 1850 for this site and um, 1874 or so, and then subsequent to that it was used as the sub-treasury. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the history here. Um, we're all familiar with the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill. Uh, James Marshall was a foreman at that, uh, at that lumber mill, and a couple of workers there, who I believe were Mormons, uh, connected to the Mormon Battalion uh, from the Mexican-American War, discovered some gold in the tail race of that mill. Marshall was able to identify it as gold, uh, but that was in 1848, and it really didn't result in the gold rush until 1849, and that's when you see a tremendous influx of people coming into California. Um, in 1848, California was really the end of the world. Um, you had a lot of um, cow farms, uh, you, you, you had a fishing village where we are right now, uh, there, was, there was a garrison, formerly a garrison of uh, Mexican, rather, uh, Mexican troops here, but there really wasn't a whole lot going on, hunting and trapping, um, you know, ranching, but there weren't very many people here, and there wasn't much in the way of um, infrastructure. Starting in 1848, you have a tremendous number of people who are finding gold, and gold has a tremendous amount of value. However, uh, a nugget of gold coming out of the ground isn't necessarily an object that's easy for someone to value. Uh, naturally occurring gold has a you know, varying fineness. You have to be able to weigh it, you have to be able to understand whether or not it's real. And so the importance of coining that gold, turning it into a usable medium of exchange is incredibly important. Um, one of the stories that you hear an awful lot when you talk to people who are into coins is the whole idea of what can you raise in a pinch. We've all heard that term before, and it actually originated in San Francisco in the saloons. Uh, if you were trying to get a job as a bartender at a saloon in San Francisco, if you had a big thumb and forefinger, you had the job because the way that people paid for drinks was they would have a poke with gold dust and nuggets, little tiny bits of gold in it. And in order to get a shot and a beer, let's say, it would, it would cost a pinch, that bartender would reach in there and pull out gold. And whatever he pulled out, that, that, was, that was what you were paying. So if someone had a big thumb and forefinger and maybe really greasy hair, uh, they would really, have a tremendous uh, earning potential compared to someone with maybe smaller hands. Um, so 
Gold is found in 1848, and actually the very first coins struck from California gold are struck sometime in 1848, but not in California. Um, as I mentioned before, the Mormon battalion was here following the, uh, the, Mexican, the Mexican War, and members of the Mormon battalion brought gold back to Salt Lake City. Um, and it's fairly well known with people who study coins that in December of 1848, the Mormon church struck $10 gold pieces. Um, and those are believed to be the first identifiable coins from California gold. However, um, I, I was recently doing some research and discovered that five Mormons were arrested at the Pueblo of Los Angeles in mid-1848, passing what they referred to as counterfeit gold coins, um, which actually had gold in them. So I have a suspicion that the Mormon mint uh, before striking Mormon coins were actually, uh, was maybe, possibly, a counterfeiting operation. <laughs> so, just uh, some kind of interesting background information. So here we have a picture of San Francisco in 1849, and you can see that it's, uh, it's been developed a little bit, but it's a relatively sleepy place. By 1850, it's a little bit busier. You have a tremendous amount of people here, you have a tremendous amount of gold, and you have need for gold coins. And in early 1849, a gentleman by the name of John Little Moffat, who was an assayer, arrived in San Francisco and began a company called Moffat & Company. Um, sources either say that he established his company on this site or on Montgomery Street. Um, I tend to think it was probably on this site. Um, and when he started here, he actually didn't strike coins, he was making uh, little ingots. That's a one ounce gold ingot uh, that's valued at $16. The earlier Moffat ingots actually have uh, a variety of different values. And what he was doing is he was taking gold, assaying it for people, and making it into little monetary ingots. And based upon the weight and the fineness, he would come up with a value. And there's a pair of them that exist today, the only two that are known. Uh, exist in the Smithsonian Institution, and I think one's nine dollars and forty-two cents, and the other one's, you know, twenty-one dollars and thirty-seven cents. And at some point, he realized that uh, California Placer Gold was worth sixteen dollars an ounce. Why go to the trouble? And he started making these sixteen-dollar ingots. Uh, there's about two dozen of them in private hands today. Uh, I, I don't know. I've probably handled them eight or so over the years. Uh, they're probably quarter million dollar things, pretty desirable to collectors. Uh, however, in July of 1849, a German engraver by the name of Albrecht Kuhner arrived in San Francisco and began uh, creating dyes for Moffat. And so this is, this is one of the first Moffat coins that was issued. It could very well have been struck on this site or right around the corner. Uh, that's a Moffat $10 gold piece. Um, these would have circulated widely throughout San Francisco. Uh, he was believed to be the second uh, California coiner to issue coins. There was a company called Norris, Greg and Norris, that issued coins starting in April out of San Francisco and then moved to Stockton. Uh, Moffat was probably issuing coins by August. And um, this is one of his tens, and then a little bit later on that year, he began issuing $5 gold pieces like this, and uh, in 1850 was issuing $5 gold pieces that looked like that. Um, yeah. On the back side, on the outverse, it has what, an SMB? Standard mint value, okay. Um, so in November of 1849, one of these tens and a ten from another private company here made their way to New Orleans and were assayed and were found to have marginally under ten dollars worth of gold in them. And this set off uh, a frenzy in the newspapers that was probably driven by the bullion bankers. Uh, bullion bankers would buy dust and nuggets from the public at a pretty steep discount and then would ship the stuff to Philadelphia, New York, and sell it for very close to what its melt value was, and they made a tremendous amount of money that way. 
pointers like this kind of made their business model a little bit more difficult. So when it was discovered that Moffitt's tents had $9.83 worth of gold in it, they tried their best to put him out of business, but um, he managed to, uh, to stick around. And then in 1850, as the Californians began to uh, try to become a state, they also petitioned Congress to establish a mint here in San Francisco. Um, this did not work out because New York and Boston both demanded mints, and as a compromise, it was decided that a mint wouldn't be established here, but there would be um, what they what they referred to as an assay office, the United States Assay Office. And the assay office would not issue coins, it would assay people's gold for them, and then it would issue ingots, monetary ingots, uh, that had their values stamped on them. Uh, here we have a, a gold bullion deposit receipt from Moffat and Company. This is from 1851. And you have what has been identified as the assay office under Moffat in 1851. And I personally believe that this picture is misidentified. That is not the building that is on this site. I believe that's Montgomery Street, and I believe that that building may have been a different assayer. And that's what I'm talking about when I, uh, when I bring up the fact that there's some disagreement about when the assay office actually uh, was moved to this site. I believe it may have been here as early as 49, and I believe that the identification of this picture uh, is a hopeful identification. You'll notice it doesn't say United States Assay Office, it just says Assay Office, and there were multiple assayers in uh, San Francisco in 1849, 1850, and 1851. Um, however, Moffitt applied to the government to run the Assay Office for them and was awarded the contract in 1851. And this is one of those ingots that I was describing to you. This is a $50 ingot, and what you'll notice about this is uh, United States of America and DNC are sticking up out of the coin, but if you look at that 887 and the 50 and the 50 right there, those are actually hand punched into it. And so what you're looking at here is an ingot that was made in a 13-step process. Uh, they would take the octagonal two and a half ounce ingot that would have $50 worth of gold in it, and they would strike it with that round seal on the front. The back actually would be held against uh, a piece of steel that had an engraved design in it, sort of an anti-counterfeiting device. And then they would hand punch around the rim, which you can't see here, but the actual edge of the coin says 1851, United States Assay Office, Augustus Humbert, sorry, 1851, San Francisco, Augustus Humbert, United States Assayer of Gold. And that's all on the edge of that. And it took 13 steps to make these. The reason that they made them this way is they were conceived of as being a multi-denominational ingot. No one has ever seen any other than these $50 ingots. Nobody wanted a $200 or a $500 or a $1,000 ingot. They wanted coins. And um, this sort of became an issue here. There were, there were private coiners operating in San Francisco, although by 1851, the private coiners were sort of being run out of town by the, by the bullion bankers. Um, but people wanted to have coins that they could actually use in commerce, and a $50 gold piece like this wasn't particularly helpful. Um, so by late 1851, they'd done away with the multi-denominational ingots and actually started striking these, which look very similar, but all of the information is in the die. They're all $50 gold pieces, and uh, again, the assay office here was striking these pieces. Uh, this, particular, this particular slug is the finest known example of all of them. It was uh, found by a bottle digger in 1973. Uh, he and his brother were walking along um, the edge of the water where a bunch of landfill from a big construction project had been dumped at dusk and they, they saw something glinting in the water, and there was this and a $5 gold piece from one of the private manufacturers here. Um, and this piece 
came to me in 2008 uh, with dirt still on it. I, I removed all of the dirt for him. And subsequent to that, it uh, was graded higher than any known piece, and it was sold two years ago for a million dollars. I'm an oyster point. I'm a bottle yeah. digger, so I I remember when he found that coin. He kept it forever. He had it yeah. for years. Yeah, well, he had he had it for years, and um, he brought it to me, left it with me. I did all of the conservation work, and immediately after I finished the conservation work, I got a call from his girlfriend saying. He thinks you're trying to steal it. You have to give it back. We're going to call the police. <laughs> so I gave him the coin back. It was sent in through an auction company, and the auction company ended up selling it at the time for about four hundred and sixty thousand dollars. And I had a client I could have sold it to for three quarters of a million dollars back then. So he ended up leaving a tremendous amount of money on the table. But it came back to me, uh, like I said, two years ago, and. Uh, sold for a million dollars. So probably the single best individual coin find in the ground. Uh, obviously, uh, if you're familiar with the Saddle Ridge Hoard, the $10 million worth of coins that were found by people in the old country uh, roughly nine years ago, that, that was a more valuable ground find, but this is probably the most valuable single coin found in North America. And then we have probably the most valuable piece of Pioneer Gold. This is actually uh, a proof slug. This was struck by the assay office. Um, you'll see how it says Augustus Humbert right there. Um, Augustus Humbert was a German assayer who was actually brought in to be the United States assayer. And all of the coins of the uh, assay office have his name on them, so we refer to these coins as hundreds instead of assay office pieces. But this particular piece was struck in late 1851, possibly early 1852, and was kept by Humbert as his personal piece. There are two of these known. The other one is in the Smithsonian Institution, and this piece recently sold for nearly eight figures. Um, and it's one of the coolest coins I've ever seen. Again, struck somewhere on this site. So here you have a picture. This is the earliest picture that we've been able to find of this site. Um, it's kind of hard to see on the projector, but there's like a funny little doorway right here. And when we see later pictures, that funny little doorway will be there. Uh, this is from a vignette on a Moffat and Company uh, I think it's a piece of stationery. It may very well be an assay receipt, but it's uh, dated 1851, and that sort of suggests to me that the at least the assay office pieces and the hundred pieces that were being struck were probably being struck in this building. So, excuse me. Let me ask a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I assume that there was a, a, a building in, in front there uh, that. So that that courtyard would not have been open to the street. Did they remove remove a building just for the image, or to be honest, I don't know. I, I haven't been able to you know dig that deeply into it. Um, we're going to see. I think we're going to see a photo of it where you can see the side of the building, but it's after the building's been uh, expanded. In 1852, the building was expanded. Okay. So. In 1851, uh, John Little Moffat was the managing partner of the of Moffat and Company and was um, in charge of running the assay office. However, he became increasingly interested in gold mining, specifically underwater gold mining. And his partners ended up at, in late 1851 buying him out. And so his partners were Curtis Perry and Ward. And Curtis Perry and Ward bought Moffat and Company out maintained the name Moffat and Company and as managing partners started a company called Curtis Perry and Ward which ran the assay office. Um, now I had mentioned that there was some dissatisfaction with the size of these $50 gold pieces that we just saw. Uh, again, this is two and a half ounces. To give you an idea, they're about that big. You can see my... Uh, so it's, it's kind of a big clumsy coin and it certainly isn't a convenient denomination. Uh, so, Curtis Perry and Ward began to petition the U.S. government for permission to strike 
five, ten, and twenty dollar gold pieces. And in 1851, uh, they were provisionally given permission to do it, and actually dies dated 1851 were transmitted to uh, to this building probably in December. And immediately after the dies arrived, they rescinded their permission. Curtis Perry and Ward then went to their attorney and got an opinion from the attorney that they could, in fact, strike coins under the name Moffat and Company. And so in early 1852, before they had permission from the government to strike assay office pieces here, they began striking these uh, $10 gold pieces, Moffat and Company $10 gold pieces. Incredibly rare, I think there's probably about 20 examples of this variety out there. Uh, that one's the second finest known, I think it's worth probably eighty or $90,000. Uh, this is the other variety, you'll see they're almost identical. The placement of the date is maybe a little bit different. They struck these for a few weeks and then received permission to strike coins for the assay office. So they began with the dies that they received in late 1851, and it's a little bit difficult to see here, but there's a, the date is right there, 1852, and the two's actually been stamped over the one. Um, as you can see, these dies broke. As a matter of fact, no one has ever seen an example without that break in it, uh, and were immediately replaced with this particular die, which again looks almost exactly identical. So they struck $10 gold pieces and they struck $20 gold pieces. Um, 20s are quite rare and as a matter of fact I found it easier to find a copy of uh, one of the two known proof pieces. Uh, this again is a coin that Augustus Humbert kept in his personal collection uh, that was sold in the 1890s by his family. Uh, this coin just traded hands for two million dollars. Um, there's one other example in private hands, and I think there might be an example in the Smithsonian. So again, this was struck here. Um, and then they also continued to strike $50 gold pieces here. Um, and they were reasonably popular, although with the advent of the $10 and $20 gold pieces, they began striking fewer and fewer of these. Now, in 1852, a couple of interesting things took place. Uh, number one, Curtis Perry and Ward expanded this building and ordered new minting equipment. And number two, the United States government passed a law making it illegal for uh, customs to be paid in coins that were not 900 fine. So you'll see here it says 887. Uh, California naturally occurring California gold tended to come somewhere around 880 to 887 thousandths fine. And so unrefined California gold, they were able to pretty readily produce pieces at about 887 fine. However, if you couldn't use the coins to pay customs duties, they really basically were worthless. As a consequence, they began to they began to work on striking 900 thousandths coins, which required parting acids uh, in order to be refined. And let's see here. I'm going to have to go back and forth because. <coughs> okay, so this is a 900 thousandths slug. Um, and so in late 1852, they finally got things together so that they were actually capable of striking 900 thousandths coins. However, these coins, and you have a, this is a 50, a 10, and a 20, um, could not be struck if parting acids weren't available to the assay office. And so every once in a while, they would run out of parting acids and they would have to shut down. And this would basically shut down the entire economy here in Northern California. Um, and the last week of February of 1853, there was a parting acid shortage. And as a result, uh, the assay office here broke the rules and actually struck emergency issues of 884 thousandths of both the 10 and 20 dollar gold pieces. Uh, this was literally a coin that was struck for one week, uh, February 23rd to March 1st of 1853. 
Uh, there are fewer than 20 of these known. This is one of the finer examples. I handled it probably two years ago. Uh, really kind of an important, rare, and frankly, really undervalued coin. And then here's one of the 20s. Uh, we're going to go back. This is what the regular 20 looked like. As you can see, it says 900 thousandths right there. This is one of the 884 thousandths 20s. This is the finest example. Uh, probably a quarter million dollar coin today. And then the final issue that came out of this building under the assay office was an emergency issue that was uh, actually flew under the flag of Moffat and Company. So after, in, in 1853, it became apparent that the United States government was going to establish a mint here and that they were going to have Curtis Perry and Ward convert this building into uh, the San Francisco Mint. And uh, in August of that year, the U.S. government shut down the assay office briefly, and while that happened, Moffat and Company was resurrected to strike these $20 gold pieces again to kind of fuel the economy of the uh, city of San Francisco. So between November and November of 1853 and April of 1854, uh, Curtis Perry and Ward were refitting this building in order to convert it over to the uh, San Francisco Mint. Now we've got another decent picture. Again, you sort of have an open courtyard over here, so my suspicion is that that actually fronted on the street, but you'll notice there are no uh, visible windows here. Um, it's a three-story building now. It's, uh, I think, 20 feet longer. Uh, I think that, yeah, they've, uh, they've gone from one chimney to two chimneys. Um, now, Curtis Perry and Ward had brought in uh, minting equipment that uh, really rivaled the equipment that was in Philadelphia. So this was a state-of-the-art mint by the time uh, the United States government took it over in 1854. And this is the very first coin that was struck on site in 1854. Uh, it is a U.S. 1854. You'll see the S for San Francisco there. $20 gold piece. Uh, this example resides in the Smithsonian. And uh, this is the letter transmitting it from the Treasury to the, the Mint at the time. The Mint had a, a cabinet of coins. And I'm going to try to read this. I, uh, it's, it's an interesting letter. It basically says, I enclose herewith, let's see, okay, I enclose herewith a double eagle, value of $20, being the first piece coined at the new branch mint at San Francisco. Um, it is a very handsome specimen of the, I think of the coin, and rather than it's being broken up and assayed, um, rather than it's being broken up and assayed, It should, something about it should be placed into the mint cabinet and preserved. And so that's how we actually know that that's the very first coin that was struck here. Um, this is widely considered what they call a proof. Does anybody here know what the difference between a proof and an ordinary coin is? Okay, so I should probably explain that. I've been throwing around the term and sometimes I forget when I'm not talking to uh, coin collectors. Proof coinage are coins that are struck either to be collected or to be presented, and they're generally struck uh, from highly polished dyes under a tremendous amount of pressure so that the, um, the impression is as strong as possible. Uh, proof coins are quite often quite a bit rarer than mint state pieces or business strikes, as we refer to them. And um, a proof coin from one of the branch mints like this uh, is a tremendously valuable thing. Um, uh, uh, 
a Morgan dollar is struck at the other San Francisco mint in proof in 1878, just traded hands for nearly a million dollars last week. To give you an idea of like how important these coins are to collectors, uh, this coin is usually referred to as a proof. Uh, that letter makes me wonder whether or not that's the case. It may just very well be a first strike, but I've seen it in hand and it's a pretty impressive piece. Um, so in 1854, the Mint began striking gold coins and gold coins only. They struck $1 gold pieces, $2.5 gold pieces, $5 gold pieces, $10 gold pieces, and 20s. Um, it's worth noting that two of these are considered major rarities um, in the U.S. coin series. They struck uh, 246 of these $2.5 gold pieces. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, ordinary coins, you see mintages in the hundreds of thousands or millions. 246 of these were struck in 1854. 13 survived today. This example is the finest of the 13. It's probably a half a million dollar thing these days. Uh, this is the 54S Half Eagle, uh, the finest of three known. They struck 267 of them or something along those lines. Um, this is a two or three million dollar coin today, um, incredibly important. It's a first year of issue from the Mint and, you know, again, incredibly rare. Uh, well, so coins were struck to order and if you were in San Francisco and you wanted coins, chances are you probably wanted 10s and 20s. They were a little bit bigger. Um, things were expensive here in 1854 and as a consequence, uh, only one order for two and a half dollar gold pieces and one order for five dollar gold pieces was made the entire year of 1854. <laughs> so, you know, they're really fantastically rare things. They're they're wonderful, um, and uh, it's one of those coins. I've I've handled three of these, including this coin. So three of the thirteen known pieces. I have never uh, been able to own one of the two 54S half eagles in private hands, uh, much to my dismay. And this particular piece is in a collection that's quite likely to become a museum, so it could very well be that only one 54S half eagle is uh, collectible in the next 20 years. Uh, the 10s are relatively available, although this is one of the finest here, and the 20s are relatively available things. So the first year of operation here at the Mint, you had all of the denominations of gold coins, with the exception of they made $3 gold pieces in Philadelphia, not here. Uh, but then starting in 1855, they began striking silver coins here. And so this is a 55S quarter, 55, uh, 55S half, it should say 55 down there. Uh, one thing that's worth noting here, you will see that there's an arrow on either side of the date. Um, that was not a regular part of the design of uh, U.S. silver coins until 1854. Uh, one of the consequences of the gold rush was that the value of gold went down relative to the value of silver. And so in 1852, 1853, people started hoarding silver coins and melting them down. And so they reduced the amount of silver that they put in coins starting in 1853. And in order to communicate to people that these were the new lower weight, they put these arrows on them so that people would be able to understand that these coins were not worth more than their face value. So there's a half dollar. And then the other coin they began striking here in 55 is the $3 gold piece. Um, Three dollar gold pieces are kind of a weird denomination. Uh, it was because stamps were worth three cents a piece. And so if you wanted to buy a book of stamps, it was three dollars. And so they started making it basically as postal currency. Um, and here is a proof 1855 S3. So you see the tremendous difference between the two, the mirrored surfaces that almost look black. And, you know, just the uh, the quality of the detail is tremendously uh, clearer on a proof. Um, this is probably a three or a four million dollar coin today. I think there are two 55 S3s 
in private hands and one that was in the Mint collection, which is now in the Smithsonian. Although one of the 55 S3s in proof disappeared about 25 years ago. Uh, it's rumored to be in Australia, but it was stolen out of the mail. Oh, the on that. Um, well, actually, so this is a depiction of Liberty as an Indian princess, and the model, it is believed, for this particular bust uh, was uh, James Barton Longacre was the engraver, and his daughter was allegedly the model for the for the Indian bust, and also actually the same model for the uh, the Liberty head. Although I see the uh, I see the similarities, although I think we're talking about designs that are uh, probably fifteen years apart, sixteen years apart. Um, in 1856, they began striking dimes here. And in 1859, they struck the very first silver dollar that was struck here. Um, in 1861, they began striking a new design for the dime. You'll see that it says United States of America. Uh, that had always been on the back. And then in 1863, during the Civil War, they struck the first half dimes here. A uh, denomination we're not familiar with because they've been replaced with the five cent nickel that we're familiar with. Um, so in 1866, following the end of the Civil War, uh, there was a major design make change made to all the coins in the United States that were of substantial enough size to fit it. There's a uh, See this ribbon here, it says, In God We Trust. This is the first appearance of In God We Trust on a U.S. coin. Uh, they began doing that in 1866. Uh, following the Civil War, there was a movement uh, started by a preacher in uh, Pennsylvania to add some sort of commentary about God onto coins. And so that began in 66. The quarters that were struck here all had it. Uh, however, the half dollars come in both with motto and no motto varieties. The no mottos are quite rare. Uh, they were only struck in January and February. And then you have no motto $5 gold pieces and with motto $5 gold pieces. No motto $10 gold pieces and with motto uh, $10 gold pieces. And then the major rarity, uh, that's the 1866 no motto 20 there are about 125 of those known today. Um, it's one of the one of the $20 gold pieces that everyone really desperately wants. This particular example is the one that came out of the Saddle Ridge Horde, which was found uh, by the couple walking their dog in 2013. Um, when I got this coin, it still had dirt clinging to it and rust clinging to it. I was the one who who conserved it for the uh, for the family that found it? Where were they walking? Uh, in the gold country. That's as good as I can do for you. I had to sign. Uh, I had to sign an NDA about that. I've actually been to the site. Um, it was on their property. They they had sort of a hike that they took every morning with the dog, and uh, there was sort of a pathway that they walk along and. Uh, there was an exposed can about the size of a coffee can that they walked past for about a year. And as rain eroded the soil around it, it kind of became exposed enough that one morning they decided to pick it up. And it was so incredibly heavy that uh, they were convinced it was full of like lead paint or something. But as they picked it up, it popped, the top of it popped off. And there was dirt in there and a single coin was kind of sticking out of the top. Um, <clears throat> They found a total of 1,427 uh, U.S. gold coins buried in eight separate cans. Uh, the final value of the group is roughly $9 million, actual sale price. Uh, this was the most valuable coin in the group. It's probably about a half a million dollar coin today. And Oh, sorry. 
That's the valuable one. This is the slightly less valuable one. This is probably about a $75,000 coin, but you'll notice they changed the design of the back and it says in God we trust on it. That's also out of the saddle ridge word. That is also the finest known of that date. Um, that particular group of coins is interesting because over 240 coins that were found in it were in better condition than any other example that had been seen for the date prior. Um, many of them were all the same date. So, for instance, there were hundreds of 89s 20s and hundreds of 1890s 20s that were better than anything anyone had seen. Uh, but it was really kind of a tremendous um, find. So, what was the date range of the coins? The earliest dated coin, I think, was 1846, and it was well worn and clearly went into the ground, having been in circulation for a while. Um, and the latest date was 1894, and there were only a handful of 1894s. Uh, the person who buried it had a really good year in 1889. There were over 400 1889s, 20s. 1890, also a very good year. There were over 100 of those. And then 1892, I think there were about 200 1892s in there. Um, kind of a tremendous time capsule and uh, you know the coins were brought to me unconserved pretty much straight out of the ground and I spent three months slowly but surely getting all of the, the, the rust and the dirt and all of that stuff off of them. Um, really interesting experience to say the least. Yeah, seems to me I heard some, I read something about some theory that they may have been part of a of a theft from the man, or what, are there so, any theories about where they, how they got there? I can tell you what I believe, and I can tell you the backstory about that. Um, so I am reasonably certain that the coins were put into the ground by someone who was probably prospecting or doing a lot of business with prospectors and getting paid in, in, in raw gold. And I think it was someone's savings over the course of probably 25 years or so. Um, you started to see runs of dates in like the 1870s, and then you have some real red banner years or red letter years in uh, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, but the way that the coins were stored, um, you would see like you'd see one of the cans, and the bottom of the can would be a bunch of heavily circulated coins, and then there would be like stacks of brand new coins that clearly came directly from the mint were put in there and put in the ground. Um, there were no major significant robberies known nearby, and the property that it was found on was one where there were so many different people uh, actually living on the property. There was evidence of you know encampments and things like that. There was tremendous amounts of prospecting in the area. So it's really most reasonable to believe that it's sort of long-term savings. Um, the story about the um, theft was a reference to what was known at the time as the Dimmick defalcation at the, at the second San Francisco Mint, the one over on Fifth and Mission. There was a clerk by the name of Henry Dimmick who worked at the Mint for many years. And um, in, 1901, he had spent a year being the clerk who was in charge of the vault. And when his time was up being in charge of the vault, he offered to reset the combination to the vault for the next guy. Well, obviously that meant he would know the, uh, the, the combination to the vault. And so he would work late and he came in with a valise every day and over the course of <laughs> a year uh, made away with about $30,000 worth of gold pieces, or at least that was what he was accused of having done. Uh, they never actually found the coins, but the coins were coming out of what they called the current vault at the San Francisco Mint, which would have had, uh, would have only held coins that had just been struck. And so uh, the coins that he stole would have been dated 1900 and 1901, and only that. None of these coins were anywhere near so that. So that's not the uh, answer. No. So what had, what had happened is a guy who lived somewhere in South America, who was from around here, who was a fishing guide, saw the story 
and began calling my office and badgering the secretaries, saying, "Ah, oh, this is these are the coins that Dimmick stole." And I said, oh, "That's ridiculous. I'm not even going to talk to him uh, because he was sort of a, a bit of a wingnut." Well. Uh, probably four or five days after we announced the find and the story came out, it was at the time it was one of the biggest news stories in the world. He somehow got a sports writer from the San Francisco Chronicle on the phone and you know spun his tail, and the guy went and printed without checking any of his facts. And the next day, uh, the San Francisco Mint actually issued a statement saying, you know, these couldn't possibly be the same coins. But in the interim between the story coming out in San Francisco meant um, denying that they could be the same coins, I got a phone call from a, a reporter from the LA Times, and she had this tone of voice with me that let me know that she was pretty sure she had me over a barrel. And you know, she, she and I, I already knew from before we made the or, you know, before the story broke, I knew all about the Dimmick defalcation. I knew why they couldn't be related. And just kind of calmly walked her through it, and it was uh, it was one of the more interesting phone calls I've had in my life. <laughs> it was kind of nice to diffuse it. Um, in 1870, they began striking uh, dollars again. And again, you've got the "In God We Trust" here. These are incredibly rare. I think there are somewhere between nine and twelve of these known. So this is probably a six or seven hundred thousand dollar coin. Um, 1870s. Yes, this is one of the great rarities here. So, in 1870, they broke ground on the second San Francisco Mint, and one of the things that they wanted to do was they wanted to put a cask of all the various denominations of coins that they were striking into the cornerstone. However, some of the coins that they put into the cornerstone, they didn't end up striking any more of that year. The half dime was one, the three dollar gold piece was another. Um, and sometime in the 1970s in Chicago, this coin, the 70S half dime, showed up. No one had ever seen one before. Um, the coin was examined by a lot of experts and deemed to be real. Uh, whether this is the coin from the, uh, the cornerstone or they struck several of them and one of them got out, no one knows. Uh, this is probably a million dollar coin or more these days. It hasn't traded hands in about 20 years. But the problem is that they, I don't think they know where the cornerstone is. They don't know where the cornerstone is, although I know someone who's been in the building with uh, sonar equipment and they believe they know where it is now. Well, the problem is there are so many corners. You've been in the building, and, you know, if, if you, first you have to figure, is it a corner on the outside or is it a corner on the inside? And the corners of the building, it's not just a rectangular building, they actually have sort of parapets. And so, and what floor is the cornerstone? No one knows. So this is one of the great mysteries, and I really wish I could just buy the, the you know, buy the building just to find the cornerstone, because <laughs> there's probably $20 million of coins in the cornerstone. Yeah, I know, and you know, they, they didn't strike while the iron was hot. It would have been a, a wonderful thing for the historical society if they if they found the corners. Yeah. Um, and then in 1873, and sorry, I was being very sloppy. This should say 1873 S trade dollar. Uh, they began striking a new denomination entirely. This is a trade dollar. Um, these coins were actually made for trade with China, and they were made to correspond to the weight of Spanish dollars, which is, uh, you know, was the preferred silver coin in China. Um, and so these coins were really not meant for circulation in the United States. They were never made legal tender. Um, interestingly enough, they were used to rip workers off. Uh, railroad towns and mining towns would buy these trade dollars. They had about you know, 70, 75 cents worth of silver in them. And they would buy them for their silver weight and then they would pay their employees in them at their face value. And they'd be acceptable in the, uh, in the company store, but they wouldn't be acceptable outside of town. <laughs> so, you know. And then uh, in 1873, we see the return of these arrows. Um, this is a result of the Comstock load. 
when the Comstock load was found, was starting in 1859 with the big bonanza didn't come until quite a bit later, uh, the value of silver suddenly dropped tremendously relative to the value of gold. And as a consequence, they had to put more silver in coins. And so they used the old arrow trick again to kind of clue people in that the weight didn't change. And then you have, uh, this is the 50, sorry, the 73S with arrows, quarter dollar, and the half dollar. And then we have the very mysterious 1873S dollar. This is struck in the last year or two that the, the mint was located here. 700 of these were struck. No one's ever seen one. I actually made this in Photoshop, and unfortunately the, the image quality isn't such that you can see the cute little S that I put on it. Um, but 73S dollars were probably struck. Um, 700 were made, no one ever saw one. If one turned up today, it would be priceless. And so this is sort of the end of the era. Uh, by 1874, coins were being struck over at the new mint. And this building was shut down and refurbished to be used as the sub-treasury uh, for the United States and San Francisco. And so that's a bird's eye view of the coins that were struck on this site. Um, I could not possibly get into everything, but I sort of tried to show you each individual denomination and type. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thanks. Not here. Really? No, the first cent wasn't struck in San Francisco until 1908, and that was at the, uh, at the new mint. Relative to a dime or uh, old silver dollar, there has to be quite a bit of variation in what you've shown us. So the yeah. smaller the denomination obviously is closer to the original. Yeah, exactly. So, so if you if you want to get an idea of the sizes of these coins in your hand, dimes, quarters, half dollars would be the size that we're used to seeing, although we don't see too many half dollars these days. Uh, a dollar would be about this big around. Um, a half dime would be really tiny, probably, I would say about five-eighths of an inch across. Um, in terms of the gold coins, gold dollar is actually really incredibly tiny. You're, you're talking about about a quarter inch across for the first type, which is the smallest. Uh, quarter eagle, which is a two and a half dollar gold piece, would be roughly roughly the size of a dime, a little bit bigger than a dime. Uh, the five dollar gold piece is a little bit smaller than a quarter, a little bit bigger than uh, nickels that we see, and then uh, ten dollar gold piece is a little larger than a quarter, and a twenty dollar gold piece is about the size of a half dollar, a little bigger than a half dollar. So, it's sort so of the thickness of the coin mm -hmm. isn't going to vary. It's what it's what's the composition. Actually, the thickness also varies. Oh, okay. So yeah. Uh, half dimes are thinner than dimes, are thinner than quarters, are thinner than halves. So, um, yeah, ba basically the larger the denomination, the thicker it is and the larger it is. Can you describe a little bit how you uh, clean up a coin that maybe it's found in a... So, the first thing I would say is don't do it. Find <laughs> somebody to do it because you will destroy it um, to give you an idea the first 75 coins that came out of the ground uh, at Saddle Ridge, they, they cleaned them up a little bit and they ruined every last one of them. One of them was an 1868S20 that you know was probably worth about $4,000 when it sold. However, before they got to it, it was probably a four or five hundred thousand dollars big white mark on the wall. The back of the coin was essentially perfect. There wasn't a mark on it. There wasn't a hairline on it. The front of the coin, no marks at all. But you know, there's some grit on the coin, and they went like that, and it destroyed the coin. So you know, one false move, and you can turn a half a million dollar coin into a four thousand dollar coin. In the um, what I've tended to do over the years is I start with the gentlest possible solvent water 
and see what that does and kind of experiment around. One of the great things about the fact that there were 75 coins that had been mishandled in that deal is I had perfect guinea pigs to be able to figure out um, what solutions would work that wouldn't have an impact on the color of the gold. Uh, one of the interesting things about that group of coins was that they had been underground and they had been protected from oxygen. And so the color of the coins as they came to me and the color of the coins today quite often uh, was sort of the same color you would expect to see from a brand new coin. I mean, they, were, they were paler, the, 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 the metal in them hadn't uh, toned in the way that um, you ordinarily would see on a, on a coin that was that age. And so uh, I think, just to give you a, so here are the 1866. So that wasn't from there. And you can see there's kind of a toning spot there. And it's got kind of a, a yellow gold with kind of some reds and, and copper colors going on. Uh, again, you see sort of a lot of toning on this one. It's darker, coppery around the edges. Uh, this is sort of medium. The, the, those are sort of the, the, the standard colors you see on original coins from that time period. And then these are the two coins. And they look, they're not that pale in hand, but you can sort of see the luster is a little bit more intense on these. And you, you see that the color is not, uh, not as uh, deep and as orangey. Uh, because the copper that's in those coins hasn't been in contact with oxygen and other contaminants over the years. Have they, have they all been taken out of the cans when you saw them? They'd all been taken out of the cans. They were delivered to me. So the first group that I saw, I sat down with the family and their attorneys and they had like a cigar box sized box. Um, and in it, they'd taken like a piece of foam core and they cut out like 18 cutouts, square cutouts. And there were 18 coins placed in them inside of, I think they must have been like Halloween candy Ziploc bags. They were weird little Ziploc bags that had crows on them. <laughs> and, and each bag had a sticker on it. And the coins were in there and they, you know, they still had like rust and dirt and stuff on them. And when they delivered the rest of the coins to me, they were in, you know, boxes in, in those baggies. And, you know, I would carefully take them out and, you know, try to, try to make sure because that Because earlier were, you said something about the, the, the used coins were at the bottom and then they kept the stacks of ones. Yeah, they, so kept, you know? they kept track of how the things came. And I, when they came to me, I got as much information as yeah. I possibly could from them because everything had kind of come out of an interesting context and I wanted to maintain that for, for the future. It's a kind of an interesting story. They found the coins, they found the very first uh, group, they took them down to the house, cleaned a bunch and said, oh, we shouldn't do this. Went back up, found another seven cans of coins, brought them down to their house, and then thought, what do we do with these? We can't bring them to the bank. What, what do we do? So they took a cooler, put all of the coins into a cooler, dug a dug a hole under their <laughs> under their uh, under their firewood pile, shifted the pile, dug a hole, put the cooler in there, buried it, and put logs on it, and then you know talked to an attorney. Someone else to find. Yeah, exactly. So it's you know the coins were buried twice at least that we know, which is kind of a funny thing. Yeah. This is kind of an awful yeah. subject, but like, do you get involved with uh, like shipwreck? Coins, Some of them, yeah. Have to handle the um, they're a little bit different. My understanding with deep water shipwreck coins is, generally speaking, they bring them up from the bottom of the ocean and they actually keep them in the same water that they found them in uh, for a while, as they kind of as as the water uh, as the coins in the water adjust to the pressure. And I. I don't know if there's any scientific basis for them doing it. Um, I'm friends with the guy who's done the best conservation work on, on coins from shipwrecks that uh, Central America, from my perspective, is really sort of gold standard, part of the uh, for conservation on underwater finds. And um, he's got his own process. Uh, he's a chemist, I'm not a chemist. Though. 
more homeless, but schlock. But uh, he, he's done a really terrific job. I've seen other shipwrecks that are handled by big companies where the coins look like tin foil and they're really, really bright, the wrong color, the wrong texture, because they put them in incredibly uh, strong chemicals that actually basically eat away the top surface of the, of the metal. This is, again, a little bit <coughs> off the topic, mm -hmm. but uh, I think when that horn that uh, we got to have the gold kind of was first uh, publicized, there's this legend of confederacy in mm -hmm. the war. That's and another actually, popular one, yeah. yeah. Have you come across anything involved in that? We talked a lot about that, like the people who found it and I talked a lot about that as a possibility. And to be perfectly honest, just, you know, Occam's razor sort of says, well, that's ridiculous. The vast majority of the coins uh, were struck at the San Francisco Mint and quite apparently had gone from the San Francisco Mint directly to the person who had buried them. Um, it's, it's hard to adequately describe the incredibly high condition these coins are. Not specifically that fine. Oh. Other forms. What is the legend? So, so, so the legend is basically um, the Knights of the Golden Circle. Golden Circle. And so there's this legend that uh, a group of Confederate uh, soldiers post-war had taken a tremendous amount of gold and buried it so that when the South rose again, there would be money. And it's possible. I mean, you know, that's basically what the good, the bad, and the ugly is about, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, that's that's sort of the story that, you know, they're looking for the guy's grave where all of the coin and he was a Confederate soldier. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a likely sounding story. The question is whether or not it's true, and you know, one of the things I'll say about buried treasure, um, I personally believe that there are probably hundreds of <laughs> caches of gold coins like these, probably all over California. To understand uh, the banking system, the problems with the banking system in the United States, and the fact that people who have a tremendous amount of money often live more than a day's ride from them. Um, it would be reasonable if you were alive in the you know, mid to late 19th century to put coins in the ground and things happen. You know, people, people go see now, people die suddenly, uh, nobody knows where this stuff is and it would not shock me if you, know, if you had a magic wand and you could wave the magic wand and it would show you where all the buried treasure is in California, but you might have 200 heads or 300 heads. Um, but the problem is, you know, we're in such a vast state and, you know, there were people, you know, the gold regions are pretty tremendously large and spread out. Um, you know, you can spend your whole life looking and never find anything, or you could walk your dog one morning and walk <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.